Welcome into the Atlanta Enquirer podcast, Jeremy Warner, and it is Monday, and this is the last Monday with Mike for a while. And uh, sadly, this is kind of a depressing kind of, I guess, cathartic for people who want to listen to it, Carp. I don't know if the podcast numbers will probably go down the next couple of weeks because it's tough to, to relive and to go through what uh, Illinois basketball just went through, which is one of the most disappointing NCAA tournament losses in their history, given the expectations, given when they lost, given who they lost to. So um, I, I haven't listened to your podcast yet. What was it like for you? What were the emotions of that second half where, to be honest with you, they, they never really looked like they had a chance? No, they didn't. I mean, talk about keeping a team at arm's length. And that's what Illinois did a few times this year, whether it be at Duke early in the season where they were up 15 seemingly all game at Michigan, more than just keeping them arm's length, but smoking them. And that was why I was so optimistic going into the tournament, thinking that the Ohio State Big Ten tournament final, that was the new floor, where maybe you weren't as efficient as he had been in previous games, but you found a way to win, and you still scored 91 points. And yesterday was this death by slow drip. It was just an exhausting, oftentimes boring game, just because on the Illini end of things, there just weren't those moments that that conjured up any sort of excitement minus i guess the end of the first half but you go on that five nothing run you're like yeah and then you look at the scoreboard and you're reminded that you're down nine against a team that a nine point weed might as well be a 20 point weed for a lot of other teams so it, it kind of felt like you know sean harrington i know talked about early 2000s wisconsin teams the crazy efficiency with which they played and how they slowed it down it just felt like yesterday you know even getting within eight points, it still felt like you had a huge mountain to climb. And, and there was, like you said, not really a sense that Illinois was going to win it at any moment in that second half. It's just the the only word I can keep, com- like the phrase I keep coming up with, it's unfittingly unsatisfying Yeah, right for, for what this team did and, and what this run was, which was awesome. It was Illinois basketball is back, but outside of the Big Ten tournament, it it feels empty. Right in the Big Ten tournament, yeah. In the Big Ten, you know, if that's why I thought the Big Ten championship, the regular season, meant so much, is because those stuff matters to me. And that, and for me, that those Big Ten championships do tell you how good of a program you have. But the NCAA tournament is so cruel. It, it is so cruel. And what's hard with Illinois, unlike Kansas when it loses Carp or, or Duke when it's lost early, is you know you're going to get many many chances with those kind of teams. Like, you know, it's not very far until your next one seed, right? For Illinois basketball, you waited 16 years for this team and you don't know when you'll get it back. Now, if Kofi Coburn came back, maybe you have that chance next year, maybe two or three years from now, or I guess one or two years from now, Andre Corbello is an upperclassman and you retool with all these great prospects and and you have another chance and you turn into say what Michigan had with, with Beeline maybe you get back to that and this this eases the pain of this eases but it's just you waited so long for this and it's it's just unsatisfying it's really disappointing and it it doesn't take away for me like it's still a special team right but now it's a special team that will always have that yeah but yeah but yeah way tournament they they flopped and we're gonna get into io in a bit i know i mean in thinking about the disappointments yesterday and There are a few things that give you that pit in the stomach, you know, sick kind of feeling, Io being one of them. But for the team as a whole, growing up, I remember hearing about maybe the 89-90 team after the final line. That team, I think, finished 11-7 and in the Big Ten. Didn't have a Big Ten title, but they were loaded. I think Kendall Gill, Stephen Bardo, Marcus Liberty, I think, might have still been on that team. And then they lose in the first round. And forevermore are known as the team that severely underachieved. And what's so jarring about the way things ended is the crazy wave with which this team rode the last six, seven weeks of the season to end in that manner. And not just to lose, but to look as bad as you have all season long. And kudos to Loyola for a lot of that. But it just goes completely against this crazy, really two and a half, three week stretch where you were beating top 10 teams on the regular and thinking, well, not only did he get a one seed, but you are probably the second best team in the country. Oh, look at Ken Palm agrees with us. You're the second best team in the country. You're the sexy pick to win the national title. And for the first time in my life, I did so unironically and with no fanboy attachment. I thought that they were the playing the best ball in the country. So, and then it's just over. It's the finality of it 
where not even making it to the second weekend, it, it will call into question the legacy of this team. They are firmly entrenched in the very good Illini teams yeah. and the very good in the hall of very good, which I know we talk about with baseball sometimes, but you need to do more in this single elimination tournament. Granted, you need to do more in order to really ascend to the lofty heights of even a 2001 team that made it to the elite eight. I always thought carp the, the problem with this team was it was the next great team after maybe the greatest team of 05. So the expectations of what they should look like during the regular season, right? When, when they're going through some struggles early, people are like, ah, this, this ain't a great team. I thought, well, wait, Mm -hmm. wait, let's, let's get a whole season here. And then they hit that stride where I, I don't know about you, but like 2001, that felt like more of the comp for me. They weren't as old. They weren't as big and physical, but I do think talent wise, they, they were up there. Uh, we were a different kind of team, but guard play, I thought, was was even better on, on this team. Um, so that's where I kind of thought that they were, was like they could be that kind of team. An Elite Eight run, you know, you want to get to the Final Four, but if you had an Elite Eight run, like this still would this would have been one of the best teams ever yep. in Illinois history. Um, if they got to a Sweet 16 and lost, then then we're, we're arguing about that. But, yeah, I'm with you. Like, 0-1 will hold a, a more special place. And if people want to say – Oh, three Oh four, you know, is, is higher than this team. I, I can't argue with you. Um, you know, I think this team beats Loyola, maybe six out of 10, seven out of 10 times. I mean, Loyola is really good and they were under but they just ran a clinic. They just ran a clinic. And I do think the lack of NCAA tournament experience really impacted this team because we could talk about the pressure of a big 10 tournament or the pressure of, trying to get a share of the Big Ten title, it is not the same as Sunday morning of an NCAA tournament game, right? And Sean Harrington's talked about that. People have talked about that. It is not the same. And, and my guy, Michael Tulip, actually looked it up, Carp. The last number one seed with no NCAA tournament experience was 1999 Auburn. Wow. Like it, it's been that long. And I, I think it's a role. It's not the only role. Loyola played great. Illinois played poorly. And to be honest with you, the staff got out coached. There, there's no question. They had, they said they had all the adjustments they made in the toolbox and it just didn't work. Um, man, it took them too long to make adjustments. The adjustments did not work. And, and Porter Moser put on a coaching clinic to where, boy, that guy's making a lot of money right now. Cameron Crutwig was the toughest guy in the court. Lucas Williamson outplayed a first team all American uh, hat tip to them, but also, you know, Illinois, it was clear that they were not as tough and not as ready for that moment as Loyola was. It was the most disappointing um, NCAA tournament loss in my lifetime. You know, I mean, Austin P. I, you know, I was what one, I don't remember that 87, I think it was. So I'm sure that that had its own disappointment, but this was a team that I think rightly so we thought could win a national title and the rest of the games yesterday did nothing to dissuade me from that notion. Initially I texted Trevor and Isaac before we hit record and I think we were all trying to mentally prepare ourselves for the worst, as most Illini fans were at halftime, thinking, this doesn't feel right. Arizona, 15-point deficit, no. Th- this doesn't did you, feel right. Did you hear, I don't know if you were recording already, the, the, the guys on CBS, like at halftime, they're like, I think Illinois comes back. And I don't know if they were just saying that because it's a one seed and we've seen Illinois come back. I was like, I don't know about that. Yeah. It's like, maybe, maybe you're just saying that to create some drama. I go, you know, maybe if you have an initial burst, but and they did. Kofi got a couple buckets early, but man, Loyola just responded. And the one thing I kept saying about the second half was your offense is doing okay. Your defense was crap. It, Terrible. One point one eight per points per possession. They were tearing you up, and, and Kofi struggled, and Io struggled, and Frazier struggled. Like everybody, and and that's what I didn't see coming. Carp is I thought Io could have a, a poor game, right, or, or that Kofi could get in foul trouble. I didn't think everybody would basically have a poor game. I mean, Adam Miller was, was good offensively. Andre Corbello had some good moments, uh, and I thought was pretty good, probably their best lead guard yesterday. Um, but even those guys didn't play great. Like, everyone, Grandison was terrible. Demonte Williams didn't make an impact. Um, Trent Frazier was one Trent, of them, him. right? Like, Georgie was a non-factor. Everyone played poorly and against Loyola. You can't do that. 
No, you can't. Uh, but I, I agree. At halftime, I didn't see them talking about that, but I didn't have that good feeling. And then, you know, the first four minutes come and go, and you go into that first time out, and you're down seven. And we do this thing on the podcast where, okay, uh, every four-minute increment, uh, did you lose or did you gain in the second half? Oh, we gained two points. Oh, wait, Loyal is going to the line after the break. So really, it, it negated itself. And then before you know it, they're up nine at the next break. They're up 10 at the next break. They're up 11 at the next break. And you mentioned the defense for Illinois yesterday. Obviously, Loyola's defense was phenomenal. Credit to them. Uh, but Illinois' defense giving up 71 against Loyola, you mentioned the points per possession. That's essentially giving up 90-plus points to your average college basketball team. And, and what made it so torturous, I actually found a Bears comp, which that's always, you know, dangerous waters to tread. But – I remember the late Levy Smith and early Mark Tressman era where I'd be watching on a Sunday afternoon. And before I know it, there's five minutes left in the fourth quarter and the bears are trailing 13 to 10. And then now they finally start showing urgency too little, too late. Right. And that's what it felt like in the second half when you got to the eight minute timeout and then you got five minutes to go. And Loyola is taking those 30 second chunks out one at a time and painstakingly ending each possession with yet another layup. It was aggravating on one hand but there was this weird bit of apathy that set in and maybe that was a coping mechanism i don't know but like i didn't have a whole lot of anger yesterday because i didn't have a whole lot of opportunities to get into the game in the first place yeah i mean it was just sad it's it just, was sad and and let me say this i know the sister gene storyline is annoying to everyone that doesn't <laughs> go to Loyola or isn't oh, it you know national yeah. thing that's an easy team to root for, man. Like what, what a performance uh, that was by Loyola. And now in the Midwest bracket, like they should be the favorite. I mean, yeah. they, they should be the favorite in that thing. The Oregon state's playing great. Syracuse never count out that two, three zone and uh, <laughs> in the NCAA tournament and in Houston, um, you know, took advantage of a Rutgers meltdown there, but that, that's what makes it even sadder is man, the path. We knew it was tough early. Right. But we, we thought if they could just get to the sweet 16, this might not be that difficult uh, to get to a final four. So that's what it comes back to. It's just, it's so sad that when we think of Io DeSumo's career, this is, this is a big part of it. And Huge. whether that's fair or not for a guy who has given so much uh, to the university and, and brought Illinois basketball back and, and that will be his legacy now. His legacy isn't, oh, he led Illinois to a Final Four and a lead eight and, and one of the best seasons ever. It's now he made ba- he didn't, he made Illinois basketball relevant again. So I guess in that way, he's more like Eddie Johnson, right? Like he's more like an Eddie Johnson figure probably than a D Brown or or maybe even a Kendall Gill or, or Nick Anderson, right? But he's still one of the all-time greats, it's obvious. But I mean, that was one of his worst college performances in the biggest moment. And that just it's a credit to IO that that is so shocking because for one, like he looked really human, looked really human. And we haven't seen that. We just expect him to put his cape on and, and save the day. And he certainly didn't do that. And, and a lot of that is credit to Lucas Williamson, but it's just sad that that's the pockmark, right? Yeah. I mean, let's talk about legacy for IO. I think it is secure. I think the Eddie Johnson comp is a good one, but the scary thing to me is that it is so reliant on what Illinois does next. Like a lot of Eddie Johnson's legacy is built on the fact that Lou Henson then went on this crazy run in the eighties and Eddie Johnson was the first, right? He was the first guy in that extended run. So that could certainly be the case. And I think that over the next month as Brad Underwood, I would assume continues to recruit well and really shores up this 2021 class and we get a better picture of what next year's roster is going to look like. Some of the pain of yesterday will even be absolved by that within the next three, four weeks because there'll be that excitement going forward. But if Brad Underwood is not able to capitalize on what we saw this year, then unfortunately that's inextricably linked to IO's legacy. Um, What he did, yes, he brought you back. Right now you are back in a way that you haven't been for 15, 16 years. But if that is not sustained by this coaching staff, that minimizes the impact of what IO brought. I don't want to be a, a prisoner of the moment. I don't want to overreact. But if I look at the Mount Rushmore of Illini guys, and, and Iowa was firmly in that conversation, usually the other guys on that Mount Rushmore, if we have that silly kind of conversation, had postseason success that they could hang their hat on. And I know that was taken away from Iowa and that team last year, so it's kind of unfair. But it's not just losing to Loyola. 
yeah, a buzzer beater, heartbreaker. It, there would have been probably more acute pain from something like that. But you went out with a whimper, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I have not seen in all my years, I've seen disappointments. And you can say UNC 05, there were five pros on that team. You could say Arizona 2001, five pros on that team. I can look at disappointing exits for number one seeded Illinois teams. But for the most part, it's against teams that were national title threats. That that may remain to be seen with this Loyola team. But there's there's not five pros on that team. There aren't. And and we're going to look back on that. I, I, I was trying to you know cheer up Isaac and Trevor because they're younger fans. I can't. I mean, in my 34 years, this is the worst tournament loss. A lot does depend on what happens next, Carp. But let's talk about that um, because I do think that that's going to be important context historically for for how we do look back at this team. So let's talk about what's next. Next on the Online Choir Podcast. All right, Carp, I'm already putting together my top 10 storylines of the Illini offseason. And, and number one is just to see how high Io DeSumo goes in the draft, right? Like yesterday, yeah, you saw flaws. And I don't think those are new flaws that, that the NBA didn't know about. He can get loose. You force him left and he can struggle. Uh, turnovers, you know, he, he has. And, you know, I don't think it changes very much, though. I, I think he's going to be a first-round draft pick. And I think he's going to have a long NBA career. So I think that's going to be a celebration for Io DeSumo, as well as when we get fans back in that stadium and Io DeSumo was able to come back and get his jersey the rafters. Like, that'll be a cool moment. That'll be a cool moment. You'll still have that pain of this loss, but that'll sure, still sure. be a cool moment. But the biggest story of the offseason is what Kofi Coburn does. Because if Kofi Coburn comes back and you have him, Curbelo, Adam Miller, you're probably going to add a pretty good guard in the next couple months um, that, that can really help you, whether that's Namari Burnett or Ty Ty Washington or Brandon Podzimski or Jalen Blakes, whoever it is, um, you're probably going to add a pretty good one there. Um, we'll see if Austin Hutcherson comes back, but you're obviously going to lose Trent Frazier, Demonte Williams, likely, but those guys' decisions, and I would expect them to move on at this point. We'll see, I guess, but Kofi Coburn's decision is, is way bigger, obviously, because you don't have another big man right now. Uh, that that's ready for an impact. And I'm not even saying a Kofi Coburn impact, just a starter style impact. But if Kofi comes back, you're a top 10 preseason team. You're going to be back to where you think, Hey, we can be a top four seed, top five seed. And we're going to have a chance to get to the sweet 16 again with Andre Curbelo, Adam Miller taking a big role and one of the, probably the best big man returning in the country next year. So I don't know what his decision will be. He's going to be 22. I think in September, uh, and, you know, he's helping his family make money certainly has to be a decision here. But, I mean, we saw yesterday, like, guarding ball screens is a problem. That's all the NBA is anymore. But I don't know how much he can improve that. I think the biggest, the biggest thing for him about returning might be that next year is the first year you're likely to be able to profit off your name, image, and likeness, right? And he is one of the most marketable stars in college basketball next year and i don't know how much he can make but of all people in college basketball he has among the the best to make outside of some of these five star one and done kind of nba guys coming in uh especially in in a, in a basketball crazy school in a basketball crazy state so if he comes back man i think you're gonna have another shot and and, and he could uh he could leave a, a lasting legacy i think he really likes college i think he really likes his team uh, but obviously I would never fault a guy for, for going to make money, but, but if he's back, man, you, you're going to have dreams again of, of making a run. It's huge. It's a huge decision. I think for the Underwood tenure as well, just because if he does come back, you solidify the fact that three out of your five seasons here would have been very successful. I think next year with Kofi, you are, like you said, top 15, top 10 team, and you're going to be in the top four of the big 10. You're going to get a good seed in the tournament. And as we're seeing, in this tournament, you might have been on the losing end of it, but it could flip next year. And all of a sudden, a team that isn't as good as the team before it could still make a far deeper run. And if we're trying to find an anecdotal uh, bit of evidence that might give Illini fans some solace here, just take a look at Virginia. And I think we both actually tweeted the same thing within a few minutes of each other when they lose to Ohio, a 13 seed. Well, the last time they were in the tournament, they won the whole thing. And then the time before that, they lost to a 16 seed. So we understand the nature of a single elimination tournament, but at least with Kofi back next year, you're almost guaranteed to have a good year and then continue to build on that with recruiting. And I just thought of a comp that I don't know how appropriate this is or not, but the 0203 Illinois team had Brian Cook as your superstar and you knew he was leaving and that you might take a bit of a tumble afterwards. And you had young guys in D and Darren 
uh, a backcourt that was young but still very good. I could see that with the loss of IO, you could still maintain a very high level of success next year. And it was encouraging to see yesterday that Andre Crabello and Adam Miller, out of all the guys on the roster, not named Kofi, probably had the best performances for Illinois. That they looked confident, that they looked assured out there, even if Crabello was a bit messy in the second half. And you had mentioned the Auburn 1999, uh, the last time a one seed had no NCAA tournament experience. If you are going to have success in March, you were adding these building blocks and Curbelo and Miller, I think getting that experience isn't going to hurt. And for Miller specifically, someone that this year we were so high on and, and understandably so, I think the last month of the season for him makes me as excited for his future as I have been an Illinois player in a long time because he is the complete package. I think he's going to be really good. Yeah. Like I, I think, I think as the season went along, like he had that first game where he scored his 28. It's like, I tweet out, is he going to be in the big time freshman of the year running kind of jokingly? Um, and he wasn't even all freshman team, but I think he showed a more complete game than I thought we, he would. Uh, the way he was defending, the way he was rebounding, the way towards the end of the year, as you're talking about, especially after Iowa got hurt, they started attacking the basket. And, and, you know, he was starting to look mid season carp. And this isn't like, um, you know, I, I don't want to make this like it's an insult. He was starting to look like Rich McBride a little bit to me. Like it's kind of just a stand and shoot guy, you know, good player, but maybe a little overhyped coming. Like he looked like that. Not saying that I thought he was going to end up like that to me. I I think he's more than that. I think he can be Jordan pool. Like I I think he can be a a great scorer on this team and say Kofi doesn't come back. It would not shock me if Adam Miller is this team's leading scorer next year uh but he's got to take that kind of role i mean he's got to start being the the 12 point a game guy next year with curbella with kofi coburn i don't think either of us have any worries about andre curbella i I think i think this is going to fuel him i I think he learned a lot and as you said i think he showed a ton of poise especially after that first Rutgers game in in the big 10 tournament i thought he was as poised as a player as we've seen uh during this postseason run i thought he played better than than I during the postseason to be honest with you so I I don't have any worries about him I think he's gonna be all big 10 next year but I think I think Miller can take a huge leap I think Coleman Hawkins can take a big leap but you are losing a lot of players and a lot of production um you know Io's gone Trent Frazier's gone and uh Demonte Williams likely gone that carp is I just tallied it up it is 35, 36 points, 14 rebounds, 10 assists per game, right? And Curbelo Miller can take on more of that, but you're going to need to retool here. And that's why it's important you land Burnett or Ty Ty Washington or Jalen Blakes uh, or Brandon Podzimski, right? A couple of those guys to help kind of retool. Those guys, I think, can all make immediate impacts. Uh, and then one of the X factors here is, is Austin Hutcherson. You know, what's his health? Is, is he going to come back? Is he going to make an impact? Um, you know, because they could have used a six foot six athletic guard with length that can shoot. Um, I, this team shot a pretty high percentage, but they didn't shoot a lot of threes this year. And I, I think next year they could actually be even better offensively, but without Kofi, um, defensively and, and Trent defensively, yeah. they're, they're going to take a, a step back. Um, that's why it's important if, if Kofi leaves. Obviously, they got to add a transfer big. Um, it's going to be different. I think you're going to be a faster paced team, you're going to be a different team the way you play offense and defense. And, and that comes down to as well, coaching adjustments. You know, they made great adjustments the last couple of years with Kofi as part of their team. Now they're probably going to have to adjust back if he doesn't come back. This is kind of an aside here, but I was thinking about why yesterday just has this, there's like a dull ache today. There's like this void. And even as I try to think it might be tomorrow or even Wednesday, by the time I get around to like the 200 level postmortem about what this was, There is a heaviness, like going through all this for next year. Yes. Come April, mid April, we'll be like, all right, kind of know our roster. We feel a little bit more comfortable with it. The excitement's going to be there. Season tickets are going to sell out like that. Fans are back on board. One loss is not going to negate all that, but there is an extra heaviness. And I was just thinking about how I had expectations for this team. I think we all did based on the last month that they could be the one to end this national title drought. And that I think is the, the key factor here why yesterday feels like for Illini fans yet another paper cut in this long list going all the way back to all these ah close but not quite 
just interrupt you quickly. And the, and the thing is like, Oh, one, you were three steps away, right? right. Oh, or 89. You're, you're one step away from the title game. Oh, five. You're a couple Augie fouls from possibly winning it or Luther had three or two from, from winning it. Right. So you got close. Like they're, they're, it's hard to win national championships. Obviously. Extremely hard. And I, I don't think like if this team would have went to an elite eight, I think it would have been like, okay, they, they did really well. Right. If, if they went to a final four, one of the all time great teams, if they go to the national championship and lose to Gonzaga, say, like you're still going to remember this team incredibly fondly. So even if they didn't win the national title, I think you would have been fun. Like you would have been like, that's a great year, but they didn't even come close. No. And, and- and to that point, I, I held to this after the 05 game against UNC that whichever Illinois team wins the national title may not be the best one. And that's why I thought this was an interesting team because they weren't as polished to say 05. I know 05 lost that final game, but I don't think any of us would argue that they were just a better, more consistent team than this Illinois team. But the one thing and the one element that this team had that made me very optimistic going into the tournament was I'd never in my life seen a final month for an Illinois basketball team like we had this year. We'll never see that again, by the way. Like there will be an Illinois team that maybe eventually wins it all, but they won't have a 15 game stretch like this one did. So it's I I hate the anticlimactic nature of it. I was trying to think of a comp and we're, we're restarting Game of Thrones and it's really good. But I know that at one point, towards the very end, it's not going to be very good. Got to check out. <laughs> yeah, got to check out, right? Yes. So it's like fantastic up to this point, and then it just tails off so quickly to the point of negating some of what came before. And this is this is the tricky balancing act. That's a great comp, Carp. I just Thank you. To, that is a fantastic, like, because it's not like Breaking <laughs> Bad, right? Like 05 oh, was yeah. Breaking Bad. Uh, and I know I haven't watched Sopranos yet. I'll get on it at some point. But that's probably like 89, right? Yep. <laughs> some people might... You know, debate the ending or whatever it is, but there's no question that was a, a hell of a journey. Right? Yeah, and, and Game of Thrones, it might have sagged in a few of the middle seasons at certain points, but at the end of the day, boy, crescendoed all the way up, and then when it hit the peak, just tailed off. So that's my TV comp for it. But in thinking about the legacy of this team, I tweeted yesterday that there are two truths that we can hold to, which is, one, this was a remarkable season. Historically, it was. Yep. And then on the other hand, yesterday was unacceptable. For a variety of ways. And and the term unacceptable, I don't mean that in sort of like rah rah, you know, let's, you know, pitchforks, take it to the streets kind of way, but it is almost alarming the way in which you got out coached and you got outplayed by a team that might have been underseeded, but you still got to beat. If you want to win a national title, you were eventually going to play a team, if not as well, at least as good as Loyola Chicago. So I don't know. This is the balancing act that is not going to be answered today or tomorrow or in, even in a few weeks. I think that, unfortunately, a lot of this is going to be answered by the next few seasons of Illinois basketball. Do we take any solace? Like, if you're an Illinois fan, Carps, I'll ask you this. Do you take any solace in what is happening in this tournament? Like, th- this tournament <laughs> is as crazy as any since, what was it, VCU was George, like the George Mason year. That was absolutely crazy. The year VCU got to the final four. Those 2011 were, or something. Yeah, those are two separate years, I believe. But like, do, do you take any solace? Like Iowa right now is down 10 at halftime to Oregon, who didn't even play their first round game. The Big Ten has been awful. I don't know what we make of that. Like, is the narrative, which is always a loaded word, is the narrative that the Big Ten tired themselves out or that we just overrated them this entire time. I think they're a great conference. Like, I, I thought that was one of the most entertaining Big Ten seasons we've ever seen. But do you take any solace in any of that? Maybe a, not a lot, no. <laughs> are, are you <laughs> trying to give it to for Iowa and Michigan right now, though? Like, are you rooting for the Big Ten or are you just like, everybody feel my misery? No, you know, I'm spent. I, I, I don't wish – I can't even pull off schadenfreude right now. I can't even wish ill on Iowa or Michigan. That's how low, I mean, I say low, I mentioned the emptiness and the void of it. And that's why, I mean, I'm about to have some lunch here and maybe I'll put on the Iowa game just because it's something to have on. But it is amazing how in, in two hours time, I went from fully invested in the tournament as a whole to not invested at all. And I can't conjure that back up unless I, I, I might find some distance enough to be able to do that because it has been the craziest tournament we've ever seen in terms of the high seeds that are advancing that you would not think would advance to this point. So maybe there's some credence to that. I was talking with some friends yesterday that maybe this season and the essentially neutral sites with minimal fans might have an impact on it. 
I don't know, but I also felt like if anything, it would be advantageous to Illinois and the other Big Ten teams that had an extra week in Indy that this was already basically their home base, and that's all been proven to be false. And one more thing, too. I mentioned the Game of Thrones TV reference. Mm -hmm. I think about Ken Palm and the way that they valued the Big Ten. And for some reason, it is reminding me of presidential polling in 2016 and 2020. Like, all the analytics say that, hey, this is 2020 actually wasn't too bad. If you dive into like, there are a couple of states that were off, right? But, like, some of the side, Georgia nailed it, right? Right. But, you know, but but I I think the point is, like, you know, polls or something, it it is analytical and it's based in data. And you're like, I want to be able to trust that because the sample size would tell you. And then we have this season of the Big Ten and the sample size told us and Ken Palm told us, you know, and he, he was right about Loyola. He was spot on about that, but for whatever reason, we're seeing these highly ranked Big Ten teams struggle. And I don't know, eventually, you got to win, not just for Illinois as a conference, you got to win a national title. 2000, that's a long time ago. And for us to continue to say, and I do it myself, the Big Ten is a strong conference, but eventually, (laughs) if you don't have banners to show for it, then how good are you? And eventually, the Pac-12, I know it's, what, 7-0, and that might be small sample size, but eventually they're seven and zero, and you're batting about five hundred right now or under it. Yeah, I I, w- I will still. I, okay, Pac-12 is having a good tournament. They are yeah. they're having a good tournament. <laughs> the Big Ten is still the far better conference. Like I would think, yes, yeah. yeah. But it's uh, it, it's sort of the upside down, and that's why yesterday, I was gonna I was gonna maybe do the pod today i i gotta sit on it more because i feel like even in this conversation it is a processing thing where it's difficult to figure out what the heck happened and why did it happen that way and yesterday was so uncharacteristic for most of what we saw this year that i i don't know i've, I've never had a moment in the line fandom where i've been actually stumped at what to say yeah i i will say this like criticism is absolutely deserved and i think brad underwood's a heck of a coach but there's got to be some introspection from him too right because uh, we've given him so much i've given him so much praise for i think pushing the right buttons with this team all year um but man what went so wrong there like what went so wrong whether it was the lead up whether it was in game whether it was did did you say the right things did you and for me, schematically, you know, what happened there? Because I, th- I think Stephen Gentry is an unbelievable offensive mind, and they had no counter for, for what Porter was doing. Then defensively, for your guys to let up like they did, um, wh- what happened? Like, this, you were scouting Loyola for a week, right? I know it was a 36-hour turnaround for the players, but your staff was scouting them for a week. What went so wrong there? Like, you know, it's a learning experience yeah. for them, too, and – you know, this will, if, if Brad, you know, Brad has won, hasn't been to the Sweet 16 yet. And I know he was doing most of it as Stephen F. Austin, right? But like, you know, that this could stick with him, like you said, if you don't follow it up by building off of it and, and getting to, you know, a Sweet 16 or an Elite Eight or a Final Four in the next couple of years. Yeah, it kind of stuck to Lon Kruger when he was here. And we'll see what they do today. Oklahoma playing Gonzaga. Is that right? Yeah, that's the game later today. So with Lon Kruger, I felt like, wow, really good coach. And obviously he is and probably borderline Hall of Famer, if not a Hall of Famer. But with Illinois, it felt like he couldn't quite get over that hump in the NCAA tournament. So when they went to Bill Self, it was like, ah, yes, finally the guy to get us over the top. And he did for the most part. But, you know, with Brad Underwood, I was so encouraged at the fact that he showed flexibility and was able to adapt to his team and not be stuck in one sort of mode. And that's why the 40 minutes of game time yesterday were puzzling because Loyola they impose their will and they said, we're going to play this way, but why can't you impose back and why can't you force the issue? And, and what would that be? I don't know. Uh, actually pressing because they would show it and then they'd sag off. And that was basically the last six, seven minutes of the game where, okay, guys, where's the urgency offensively? I don't even know what that, what that would be. And I'm Steven Gentry is a far smarter guy than most basketball minds are. So I don't doubt the coaching staff. You mentioned what happened in the intervening 36 hours. This is going to sound so stupid, but during a point in yesterday's game, I remembered a quote from IO's press conference where he mentioned he ate cheesecake and then Brad Underwood said two pieces of cheesecake. And in my stupid, like (laughs) monkey fanboy brain, I was like, well, you shouldn't have had two pieces of cheesecake. I'm like, oh my God, this is going to 
Yeah. I know. I know. Which is, uh, that you just shows. Up, like you lash out at certain things, right? Like, yes, of course. Like we, we had somebody, you know, I, I thought was showed unbelievable um, ownership of that mm. game yesterday, his post game press conference. And he showed incredible maturity saying like, I'm going to get better from this. We're going to get better from this. And, you know, well, most people don't take it that way. Most fans don't take it that way. And I think some fans even took that the wrong way. It's like, they wanted to hear, you know, even more like, you know, burn the house down kind of stuff. And I get it. It's, it was a disappointment. Nobody's more disappointed than them. They, they kept themselves away from their family, their friends, most of them, their girlfriends for nine months. To, to have that season and to give you guys and us a joy of watching college basketball. Right. And they did give a lot of joy. So for it to end like that, man, like that sucks. Yeah. It, it, it absolutely sucks. Cause they put way more into it than, than any of us. Um, but, and, and for him, he knows like that's going to stick with him. That's going to stick with him at Illinois. And it doesn't, it doesn't mean that, you know, people don't appreciate him but it's, it's part of his story now. And maybe it, it helps him become a better pro carp and, and he can help Illinois that way by, by having a good career in the NBA and, and being an example of, Hey, Ty, Ty Washington. We just, we just got a top 30 pick in the NBA draft and he's, he's a millionaire and you know, he wasn't expected to be a first round draft pick before he came here. So that could help, but it's just, it's, it just sucks. Um, but I thought he showed unbelievable maturity, um, but it's, there's nothing you can say after those games that's going to make anybody happy. No. Yeah, I mean, more maturity than I would have showed at 21 if I had just lost my final game of my college season, and then that's it. I would have been crying. It's over. I mean, I, I don't know how – you know, I, I was sitting in bed last night, and I'm just – I read stuff on my phone to get my mind off of it, and I fortunately was able to get a good night's sleep. I don't know if any, any single guy on that team, coaches or players, could. I mean, that's the kind of stuff where, as a fan, I, as I was saying on the podcast to the guys yesterday, the crazy thing about sports is we have zero control over what happens on the court or the field, and yet we carry these emotions with us, and we ride that wave. That's just what fans do. And multiply that by whatever exponent you want to, and that's what these guys are feeling right now. You mentioned, I'm glad you did, and I want to try to focus on this too. In this year of all years, and really in the last month and a half especially, this team treated us to something that even before the season, I would not have anticipated it going like that. It was storybook until it wasn't. So if we are to focus on the middle chapters or really the last third of the story before the very final chapter, that was something I'll remember forever. And the good thing is from the outset, I wanted something tangible. Give me one banner at least that I can raise and I would have qualified it as a successful season and we got that, and you could all, almost argue that you really should have two banners. And I think a lot of Illini fans will remember it as such for the Big Ten season. But this is the team that will take their place alongside the 98 team that won the Big Ten title, lost in the second round to a good Maryland team. That was unexpected, maybe not the best comp. But you mentioned 0304. You mentioned, oh gosh, I don't know, uh, 2001, 2002, maybe the second Bill Self team. But it ain't 05. It ain't 01, it ain't 89, it ain't 83, 84, you know? And, and I think that that is something that my expectations were, we're going to match right one of those guys. It, right felt, it felt inevitable, didn't it? I mean, to me, it felt inevitable that they were going to do something. It, it didn't feel inevitable to me. Like, I wasn't as scared about Loyola Chicago as I should have been, right? Just you know. I didn't see everybody, and I respected Loyola. It wasn't like, and I thought they were underseated. When I saw them in the eight line, when I was at Lucas Loyola, I was like, oh, Man, and then I saw Oklahoma State, and I almost liked Oklahoma State. I was like, that's a tough matchup, but it's a younger team. Like, I think they can play well against them. It's an up-tempo team. The grinded out thing, I never like. I never like playing that that veteran grinded out team, but I just thought Illinois was too talented, and that proved not to be the case. But rightfully so. You had those expectations. And I think 89-90 is probably the closest comp you can get to. That team lost first round, but it was to an 11 seed, right? Like – or 12 seed, I think 12 seed. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like that, I think that's, that, that's the best comp just because that team was probably similar talent, right? Didn't have as good of a regular season, but the expectations were sweet 16 coming off a, of, you know, final four. No one expected him to go to a final four again, but Kendall Gill is a top five pick. Steven Bardo, Marcus Liberty are, are draft picks, second round picks. Uh, and you lose to Dayton in, in the first round. So I always think that team almost gets overlooked because it was really good. And Kendall had one of the greatest seasons in Illinois history 
that year. And I think that's how IO season will now be looked at is great season, bad finish. Yeah. And, and more than that, it was, it was all the intangible things that made me think that this team had something extra, whatever that it factor is that you have with the really great teams. And it seemed like they had found that. And I, I felt as confident, if not more confident than ever, after that Ohio State game last week. I mean, think about it, the difference a week makes and the difference of what we were talking about a week ago compared to now. And even if we both undervalued Loyola Chicago, which I certainly did, and to be honest, you know, you, I, I simplified it to, well, they're a Valley team that went 24 and four and you're a big 10 team that lost six games. Like that, that, that's, I mean, it's no, it's no shot at Loyola, but that's a bad conference. Right it is. And eventually I'm just thinking, well, after the gauntlet that you went through, you're going to be prepared for anything, but you weren't prepared for the best team out of the Valley. And whatever Loyola Chicago does to me does not change what happened yesterday, because if they are in fact a final four caliber team, or they maybe even make that, you know, tricky or a sneaky run to the national title game, that's all fine and good, but it is the manner in which you lost. And you mentioned how we're going to remember IO, you know, the last game with him offensively wasn't good. It was the ridiculous number of times that he and every other guard was getting beat off of these screens and they, these cards for Loyola Chicago that I thought we got the size, we got the speed. If we could do this against Michigan, we could do this against this Loyola team. And instead it was the inverse. What you did to Michigan is essentially what they did to you. They took you completely out of your element. And uh, it was your angel. It was the toughness. It was the effort yeah. focus. And that that's what my stings so much. Cause this team was so good at those things for so long. Our carp will continue to process this man. It's not going to go away uh, nah. for a spring football right around the corner, bud. Hey, you know what? I, I will say basketball. I'm going to have to put that in a box for a while and just let it sit. But I am optimistic with what Bielma is doing. I, I think that come August when we get back to Memorial stadium and even come November, when we get back to state farm center, this sucks. Illinois fans have been through worse. I mean, there have been worse, more painful losses, uh, I think that time will tell. That's such a cliche, but I think with right. Underwood specifically, it is all about what you do next because that can soften the blow if you follow it up with another good season next year and the year after that. Better to have loved than lost than to have Hey, <laughs> you know what? Better to have went through all of that in this year of all years and have all those moments because I will say this team gave us a lot of moments. And what's funny is they didn't have a lot of them up through mid-January. If you look at the Iowa win at home, through the Ohio State win in the Big Ten tournament. It felt like every other game was one of those, whoa. Yep. And that is something that, as a sports fan, other than championships, all you can really ask for are memorable games and memorable moments, and we got plenty of those this year. I, I got to get going because I got a radio interview coming up, but like the Indiana overtime game. Yep. One, of, one of the great wins of Love the it. year. And that's like number seven on, on the list of this year. It was pretty amazing. All right, Carp, keep processing, man. We'll get through it. <laughs> Sounds good, man. We'll talk soon.